We thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, for your goodness. Oh, Father, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you minister to us this morning, that you open the revelation of your word through your Holy Spirit to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise be thy name. I don't know if you feel him, but he's here. And it's a promise. He says, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of us. God is here this morning. And, you know, if you have any needs or anything, bring it up to him. You know, there's a song we used to sing. It says, reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. Mm -hmm. You know, he's here today. And just, you just have to reach out to him. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be thy name. We have been talking about becoming a dwelling place for God. We've started that a long time ago. And we never seem to get to the end of it, but let's try again today. But um, the Bible says that God wants us to be his feel and he wants us to be his dwelling place. You know, God did not save us simply just for us to go to heaven. That's not his purpose. But he saved us so that he could live in us and be visible to this world. See, the world cannot see God, but he can see God through us. You know, and that's what becoming God's dwelling place is all about. But it takes transformation to get there. Because when we come to God, we are a mess. When we first experience salvation, we're a mess. And God then puts his spirit in us to transform us and to bring us to what Paul calls perfection. This is our scripture base today for today, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. This is what God wants us to do, is to go on to perfection. Now, perfection is to be like God. It's to be in his image and after his likeness. Jesus says that we should be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. Peter says that otherwise, he says that we should be holy, which is the same thing as being perfect. But in order to become perfect and in order to get to become back into the image of God, there needs to be transformation in our lives. And this transformation cannot go forward unless we have the foundation on. Now, we talked about building a house, and building a house requires that first we dig deep and find a rock. And we, we said that the rock that he's talking about, a lot of people say Jesus is the rock. No, it's our faith that Jesus is the Messiah that's the rock. If you don't have that faith in Jesus, that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God, you will not have a strong foundation. Your house will crumble. But if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, and that he loves you, and that he cares for you, and that he promises never to leave you or forsake you, and he's always going to be with you, and you have that insurance within you, it doesn't matter the storms of life. It doesn't matter what happens in life. You will stand strong. So we need that rock first. And Luke says that a wise man digs deep and finds that rock. And once he finds that rock, he lays his foundation on it. And the foundation is, is based on six principles Paul talks about here that Jesus spoke about and there are six of them and we have already started talking about the first two and we started the third one last time and a quick recap is the first principle is repentance from dead works now repentance here doesn't mean to feel sorry lots of time when we talk about repentance we talk about feeling sorry it doesn't mean to feel sorry it means to have to turn around to walk in the other direction to have a reversal in your life. So the first principle is that we have to repent from dead works. We got to stop doing dead works. Now the question is, is what is a dead work? You know, a work is anything God has called you to do. But when do our work become dead? Well, when a dead work is a work that does not produce the fruit that it was supposed to produce. Sometimes we think that the fruit that our works are supposed to produce is, you know, blessing somebody. And though people get blessed by our work, that is not the reason we're supposed to do the works. You know, if somebody, I see somebody and they're in need 
of, you know, some financial help. And God puts on my heart to give him $20. It wasn't, the purpose was not just of giving them $20. Now, they may be blessed, but that work could still be dead if it doesn't produce the fruit it was supposed to produce. And according to Matthew, in Matthew 5.16, it tells us, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So the purpose of the good work is not just to bless the person, but that God be glorified, that they may see God through you. So if you ever do something and you take the credit for it, it's a dead work. If you do something so that the eyes of the people are upon you, it's a dead work. We have to remember that God also tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. If you're able to bless somebody, it's because God has blessed you first. So the, the blessing doesn't come from you, but it comes from God. But if you take the glory, or if people glorify you instead of glorifying God, it is a dead work. So the first thing we have to understand is whenever we do something led by God to bless somebody, we make sure that they know that it's God blessing them, not us. So you can say things that, you know, I was able to bless you today because God has blessed me. So the blessing comes from God, no, not from me. Uh, you know, you, you, there's different ways you can bring it back to God. But make sure that at the end of the day, when, they, when the person who is being blessed is blessed, they know it came from God, not from you. And that's the first step towards going, to, you know, to, to make us being able to go towards that perfection. Is to know that we are an extension of his arms, that we are an extension of his voice. Sometimes God will give you a word of encouragement for somebody. Again, it's not you encouraging the person, it's God encouraging them through you. And you have to realize that you are only a tool in the hands of God. You are a channel for God to work through. And that was the first principle that we talked about before. Now Paul even adds this, uh, not Paul, Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 12, because a lot of times you may, tell, you may say that to somebody, well, you know, I, can, I only bless you because God blessed me. And the person may refuse to accept that or they may even laugh at you or, you know, and, and, but you at least have said it. Now Paul, uh, Peter says, have your conver conversation or behavior honest before uh, among the Gentiles. So don't be deceitful among the Gentiles. Let them know that God is the one blessing them. You know, and then he says, whereas... Even if they speak against you and they laugh at you, in the day of their visitation, in the day where God does reach them and they do get saved, they will remember what you have done and they will glorify God for what you have done. Okay? So don't get discouraged if people don't accept the fact that you tell them it's from, uh, it's from God. Know that you are a tool in the hand of God. You're an extension of His hand. And, you know... Uh, the only thing, the only way we can bless people is because we've been blessed. You know, you can't give somebody something you don't have. So if God blesses you, then it's God who gave it to you, and then God is giving it to them through you. you know. And it doesn't matter if the person is rich or poor. It doesn't matter. Uh, I remember uh, Joyce Meyer one time saying that she had this beautiful dress, a beautiful, beautiful dress, and God put on her heart to give it to somebody who was wealthy, that had lots of money. She could have bought 10,000 of these dresses. I mean, she was rich, the person. But God put on her heart to give it to her. And at first she said, I question God. She doesn't need it, God. She has the money to buy her own. Like, you know, why would you want me to give that to her? You know, but she was obedient to God. And she went and she says, you know, the Lord put on my heart to give you this dress. And the girl, the woman started crying. And the woman said, you know, you, would, you don't know how many times that, you know, You've, because you're, you have some money and everything, you feel that people treat you differently and the, people don't know that, you know, we like to have attention. We like to know that people care and, and stuff like that. And she says, you know, uh, you know, it means the world to me, you know. So it wasn't about how much money she had. It, wasn't about, it was about God touching her, selling, saying to her, you know what, God does care for me. Because Joyce said, God told me to give you this. She gave the glory to God. So it wasn't about the dress anymore. It was about God coming to her. And it touched her life. The second principle we talked about is faith towards God. And I, uh, last time we talked about this, uh, 
I made the point of saying that at first I read it wrongly. The first few times that, that, you know, that I started studying this, I always read it as faith in God. But it's not faith in God, it's faith towards God. And there's a big difference. Now, if you look at the word faith in the Bible, it, has, it carries two definitions. The first definition is to trust God, to believe that he is who he says he is, that he can do what he says he can do. And that is faith in God. It's to have faith in God, to trust him. But faith towards God is to be faithful to God. And that's the second definition of the word faith. So when you read the word faith in the Bible, sometimes it means faithful and sometimes it means trusting. But to be faithful to God is to, trust, is to never give up, no matter what's going on. And it is important to be faithful to God. And here Jesus says it's important. It's one of the things that you've got to put in your foundation. That you will trust God no matter what. No matter what day brings. No matter where you are. What's happening in your life. That you will remember that he loves you. And you will trust him. And, and uh, the Bible uh, in uh, Hebrew, Hebrews 11.7 gives us example of people who were faithful to God. It talks about Noah. Where God approached him and said, you know what, I'm going to destroy the world. And I want to save the animals. So I want you to build this ark. And I want you, to, once this ark is built, to bring in two of every kind of, uh, of unclean animals and seven of every kind of what they considered clean animals. And Noah was faithful to God. Now Noah took, according to the Bible, it took Noah 120 years to build that boat. Now, that's 120 years of people asking, what are you doing? Because up till then, they had never had a flood. They had never had anything like that. The Bible says that you know, at that time, the dew would come from the ground to, to water the plants and everything. And for 120 years, even though people laughed at him, even though people maybe called him stupid, and uh, maybe at times he even felt stupid because, you know what, he, 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 I heard from God, but you know, I, in 120 years, I'm sure you have moments of doubt and say, did I really hear good? You know, it's been taking a long time. It's 120 years here. Now, but he remained faithful through everything. And then because he remained faithful, God could use him. If he would uh, decide not to be faithful, either God would have just flooded everything or he would have found another man. But he remained faithful. Now, even his family, I'm sure, told him a few times, Dad, I think you, you have a few, few screws loose here. Dad, there's something wrong with you. What are you doing? What are you building? Now, out of respect for him, they helped him. And, I, and, and God saved his family too. But it took faithfulness to do that. The same is true with Abraham. God told him, leave your family, leave everything behind, and I will bring you to another place, and I'll make you the father of many nations. He gave him a promise. Abraham obeyed, and he left God, but that promise did not happen the next week, day or the next week. It took many years. On top of that, to be the father of many nations, you're, you should have children, and he was not had any children, and his wife could not give him any. So he had to remain faithful to God. Now, he had moments of weaknesses where he thought he had to help God and he, he slept with his, uh, his uh, nanny or, or the maid or whatever you want to call her, Agar, and he got a children through her, but a child through her, but it wasn't the child of the promise. And when God told him, Abraham, I want you to get rid of that child. I want him to, you to send him away because he's not the child of promise. Abraham was faithful. He listened to God. He loved that child. He was his child, his only child at that time. I mean, no, Isaac came uh, after, but that was his only child. I mean, his love was poured into that child. And then God says, no, I want you to get rid of him. Now, not get rid of him, meaning, you know, him dying, but he can't be a distraction to what I'm about to do with you. Then now God turns around and he says, now you only have one son, the son of promise, Isaac. But I want you to give him to me as a sacrifice. Now I'm sure that there's a lot of things went through his mind. But he was faithful. And he believed that God would do something and that the child would be saved. 
We know that because at the bottom of the mountain, when he got to the mountain where he was going to sacrifice him, he told the servants that were with him, he says, you stay here, me and the child will go sacrifice and we will come back. And he included Isaac in coming back with him. But up to, to, to the last minute, he was going to do what God asked him to do. He laid the son on the wood. He was ready to, 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 to kill him when the angel told him to stop. Now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you will put me for first. Now faithfulness is very important for one big reason because we also find out when we look at both these men that faithfulness upgrades you in your walk with God. It, it, it brings the intimacy between you and God to a new level because both Noah and Abraham, because of their faithfulness, were made righteous in God's eyes. It says in, um, it, in Genesis um, chapter 6, uh, sorry, in, uh, yeah, no, sorry, in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, that it says that in uh, verse 7, by faith, being faithful, Noah, being warned of God, of things not yet seen, moved with fear or reverence, and prepared the ark and save his house, which condemned the world. And he became righteous by the faith or by his faithfulness. So he became righteous by his faithfulness. And then in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it tells us about Abraham. It says, and Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Now, righteousness means that you have right standing with God. It means that you can have interaction with God or intimacy with God. And it was their faithfulness that brought them to that level. And this is something we're going to talk about when we deal with the, the doctrine of baptism, about the different stages in our walk with God. There is three stages in our walk to perfection. There is three stages of maturity, which also has three stages of intimacy attached to it. But even more than that, we can see the intimacy change between God and Abraham, because it says in James chapter 2, verse 23, Abraham believed God, he was faithful to God, and it was imputed or assigned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So Abraham went from being a servant of God to being a friend of God. And we see that in Moses too, because at one time, uh, Moses and uh, was having an, an argument, I guess, or bet between Aaron, him, and his sister, where they, they were jealous of him and they said, you know, you think you know, you're such a big guy you know, around here. You know, God talks to us too and this and that. And God stepped in. God stepped in and started talking to them and said, listen, to you guys, I talk to a prophet. To Moses, I talk face to face. So there is a difference. Faithfulness makes a difference. You know, once you're faithful to God, you become righteous. Once you're righteous, you can talk to God directly. You know, face to face. And God will hear you. So it's important to become faithful. And it's important for us to become righteous. Because Jesus gave a warning to his disciple. In Matthew 5.20, he says, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So God he says, unless you work on your righteousness, building up your righteousness, become righteous in God's eyes, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. No, we don't go to heaven just simply because we said, Jesus, come into my heart. That's not how you get to heaven. That's the door that opens up. But it's what you do after that will determine. Because we should never forget, and we said that last time, is that Jesus, who is your Savior today, becomes your judge on the day of judgment. And he saves us and, and he gives us life so that we can get connected to God again and become back into his, his, his likeness and his uh, image. But if on the day of judgment, we just stand there with what he did, we'll fall short. Because our Savior becomes our judge. And on the day of judgment, he's going to look at what we did with what he gave us. So he gives us the opportunity to become righteous. 
by becoming faithful to the Word of God and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Intimacy is so important, and you cannot get into intimacy without faithfulness. You do not become righteous without faithfulness. And how important it is, is if you turn to Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus said that many will come to him in that day. And what they'll, they'll have resumes of what they have done on earth. And they'll say, God, we've done wonderful works in your name. We've even cast out demons. We've healed the sick. And they're talking about all the achievements that they did. And none of those things are important. Because you're only a channel, so God is the one doing those, all those things. You know, when you say, I have my ministry... No, you, you are a channel for God to minister through you. you know? So Jesus did not say it's not true. He didn't do any of those things. He didn't say that. But he did say, depart from me. Why? Because I don't know you. You had salvation. You did works. But you never took the time to become righteous. So that intimacy can settle in. And righteousness is just being faithful. It's, it's saying to God, you know, God, I accept you into my life and I will do my best to walk by your word. And, you know, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to turn away. I, you know, no matter what faces me, no matter what I go through, Lord God, my life is yours. And that's what faithfulness is. And it's so important. Now, we, last time we started talking about the doctrines of baptism and we didn't ended there so we'll continue today but the third principle is the doctrine of baptisms and notice that the word baptism here is plur plural so we're not talking about one baptism in particular there's three baptisms there's a baptism of water the baptism of the holy spirit and the baptism of fire there's three baptism and we're not talking about the baptism itself we're talking about what the baptism is supposed to accomplish because like i said earlier our walk towards perfection happens in three phases. There are three phases that the Bible talks about. And each phase is a, is a stage of maturity, which also has a, a level of intimacy with it. And each one of the baptisms that we're going to talk about represent one of those stages. Okay, so, so it's what the, 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 the baptism is all about. And what is baptism all, is all about is transformation. It's a cleansing. It's a new beginning. So every stage is a new beginning. We sang, you know, I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man and everything. Well, this new creation, this brand new man does not happen when you confess Jesus as Savior. It ha happens along the way as you allow God to work in you and bring you from phase one to phase two to phase three. And you become a new creation along the way. You know, a lot of people believe that once saved, always saved. And there's a lot of, sadly, there's a lot of people who live that way. They accept Jesus in their heart and they think it's done. And they go back and live like the world. And how foolish are they to think that a simple confession makes your sin okay before God. It does not make your sin okay before God. Now, God gives you grace and mercy so that you have time to get out of those sins. He doesn't give you grace and mercy so you can continue to sin. And there's a big difference. So the doctrines of baptism is, again, represents three stages uh, on our walk towards perfection. Now, the first stage is represented by the water baptism, the first baptism that we encounter in the Bible. And in the water baptism, we have to look at what the purpose of that baptism was all about. And we turn in Mark 1, 4, John the Baptist tells us what it's all about. He says, John did baptist, baptize in the wilderness, and he preached a baptism of repentance unto remission of sin. So the water baptism was all about getting your sin forgiven. Now, the water baptism, only really the, the importance of water baptism in the time of John only existed for a little while until the death of Jesus. Because the death of Jesus basically replaced the water baptism. Because today we're not redeemed by getting baptized in the water. 
We are not cleansed from our sins by being baptized in the water. We are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, by the sacrifice he did on the cross. It was a temporal thing that we still honor today as an external sign of what has happened inside of us. So we get baptized today not to get our sins forgiven. They're forgiven by Jesus. But we get baptized today to tell the world that we have accepted Jesus, that our sins are forgiven, and that it's a, an external sign of something that has happened inside of us. But the reason the water baptism came out in the time of John to, the time, to, to the Jesus' death was to announce to the people of that day that God had started a new, a, a new covenant. Because there there's always been a preaching of a new covenant coming. Now, up till the time of John, the only way you could get remission of sin was by offering an animal as a sacrifice. So if you sin, you went to the temple and you offered an animal as a sacrifice. When John came, there was no need to do that anymore. Though people still continued because not everybody accepted the baptism of John as being the new way of sin being re re uh, remission or removed. But when it came to the time of John, John was saying, God is doing a new thing. God has a new covenant going where you will not need to bring an animal every time you sin. But all you have to do is repent and bring forth fruits worthy of repentance and God will forgive your sins. And we will, come, uh, we will celebrate this by the baptism of water. So as I baptize you in water, because this was the same thing with John that it is today. People's sin did not get forgiven because they were dipped in water. It was just an external show of something that was supposed to have happened in their hearts already. They were supposed to have repented already in their heart. And they were coming to say, I have chosen to repent from my sin. And I'm doing the water baptism as a sign that I've chosen to do that. And that's why when the Pharisees came to to John the Baptist, he says, you know, uh, you got to bring fruits worthy of repentance. So the, the water baptism was not some miracle water that washes your sin away. It was just a sign that has been replaced now by accepting Jesus in your heart. Now, I say this because there's a lot of people who believe that unless you're water baptized, you're missing something. And some people even believe that you won't make it to heaven. Okay. And, and, and that's not true. You can accept Jesus on your deathbed, and if you die on your deathbed without being baptized, you will still go to heaven. Why? Because Jesus' blood is the thing that cleanses us from our sins today, not the water from the water baptism. Okay? So, but this is step number one. This is the entrance, the remission of sin. Now, like I said, every stage has a level of intimacy and a level of maturity. Now, J the Apostle John speaks of all three stages in his first letter. And when it comes to this first stage, he calls us children of God. Maturity, why? We're children. We're babies, maturity-wise. And he says, I write unto you children because your sins are forgiven for his sake. In other words, your sins are forgiven because God came looking for you. You weren't looking for him. He came looking for us. The Bible says that God draws us unto himself. And nobody can come to him unless he draws us. Because no, nobody's looking for him unless he draws us. Because we're so uh, fleshly oriented that we follow our flesh, not him. Then he says, I write unto you children because you have become aware of the Father. Because you have known the Father. The word known here, the definition is to become aware of the Father. Now, so at this stage, we are what Paul refers to as babies in Christ. Okay, we're just being born again. We're just starting. But at this point, our intimacy with God is not strong. It's not big. We are aware of God, but we don't know God. Okay, and most people at that stage, and sadly, you don't have, uh, uh, the maturity Christian-wise or spiritually-wise does not happen with time. In life, your body matures, you get older, and the maturity happens you know, with time. But it doesn't happen like that in the spiritual. You have people who have been saved for 20, 30 years, and they're still at the baby stage. Because maturity, spiritually speaking, happens through obedience, through the Bible, and through the Holy Spirit. And as long as you refuse to obey, and as long as you choose to, to do your own thing, you stay at the same level. 
Now, God will encourage you to grow. He will encourage you, you know, to get closer to him. But if you don't do it, he won't do it. The Bible is clear. God says, if you draw nigh to me, then I will draw nigh to you. God says, it's always you that have to take the first steps. And the reason for that is because God gave us free will and he will not override our free will and he will not take our free will away from us. And the reason he gave us free will is because on the day of judgment, when we get the judgment that we receive, we will have received that judgment because of our choices, not because of him. It's the choices we make. If any of us end up in hell one day, it's because of the choices we made along the way, not because God chose that he wanted to send us there. So, <clears throat> He says here, he says, little children, you've become aware of the Father. Now, I've noticed, I don't know if you guys know it, but people at that stage are usually people who never pray to God directly themselves. They always ask other people to pray to God. They'll go to the pastor. They're always counting on the pastor to talk to God for them. Okay? They don't have that intimacy with God. They don't feel that close to God to say that just to come into his presence and say, God, I know that you want to hear from me and I know, and you know, they just don't have that. So, so they usually go through another person. It's just like a child. A child on his own can't do anything. They're de totally dependent, dependent on somebody else, their parent, to take care of them. They can't do it on their own. And that's what it is at that level. Jesus refers to this level as the servant level when it comes to intimacy. Your intimacy between you and God is at a servant level. Now, there's not much intimacy between the king and his servant. The, the king gives the servant his rules and tells him what to do, and the servant is supposed to do it. But the servant doesn't come up to the king and start talking to him like, you know, he's his best buddy or whatever. He has his place. And, and the intimacy is, is not as close as it could be. And that is how it is at this level. So if you choose to stay at this level... You will never be connected to God the way God wants to be connected to you. Because remember that God wants you to become back into his image, to become one with him, to be like him. And this is where it only happens as you get to the last stage. So at this level, like I said, we are a, a servant of God, uh, intimacy-wise, intimacy in a baby in Christ, maturity-wise. Now, Paul has some stuff that he tells us about being a baby. Okay, he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, he says, Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual, as somebody who's matured, spiritually speaking, but as carnal, because you're babes in Christ. So he's saying that somebody who's a baby in Christ is still carnal. They're still led by their flesh. They react by their flesh. They, they, they don't listen to the Holy Spirit. They don't apply what the Holy Spirit is telling them. They're just walking by their flesh. He says, I fed you with milk and not with meat. So he's saying, I can't teach you the way I want to teach you. I just got to give you the milk, something that you can digest because you're not ready for the meat yet. You're not ready to, to find out that sometimes God leads you into the wilderness. You're not ready to find out all these things. All you want to hear is how good God is, how much he loves you, and how much he wants to bless you. That's all you want to hear. And that's what babies survive on. You know, uh, unless you're willing to go any further with God, and unless you start growing, that's the only messages that speaks to you. And then he goes on to say, for you are yet carnal. So as a baby, you're still carnal. You're still fleshly driven. You know, when we get saved, our heart uh, is supposed to change, but our flesh takes a while to change. Or the way we react to the flesh takes a while to change. He says, you're a carnal. And then he gives example of what he means by your carnal. He says, because there's envying and strife and division and unforgiveness and all, kind, all these things are found within you. No, God is clear in the Bible. He can't forgive you unless you forgive somebody else. That's clear. Can't be any more clear than that. So if you walk around with unforgiveness in your heart for somebody, you are still a babe in Christ. You are not accepting his word. You are just still walking according to your flesh. Because your flesh tells you it hurt. Your flesh tells you it wasn't fair. Your flesh tells you you should revenge yourself. And if you're listening to your flesh, you'll walk around with unforgiveness. 
But there are people, as me and Brenda watch a lot of shows on TV, like you know, true stories about you know, tragedies sometimes that have happened to families. And there's families that have went through a lot of bad things, but you see the forgiveness that they had in them. We, I remember watching a show one time where their daughter was killed by a man. And when they, w when they went to court, they stood up for that man, asking the judge to be lenient on him, saying that, you know what, he, doesn't know what, he didn't know what he was doing. In other words, no, he was driven by the enemy. The enemy caused him to do this. And they were asking for mercy for him. Now, most people wouldn't do that. You know, it takes somebody with a changed heart to do that. And on top of that, you know, when the guy finished his prison sentence, they took him in, into their own house to, to, to take care of him, to help him get back on his feet. Now, that was the murder of their, or their child. But that's true forgiveness. That is true forgiveness. That's a heart changed by God. Most people, you know, somebody says a bad word about us and we're ready to disown them. That's the flesh. But that's the first level. Only in the second level does the word of God start changing you and you see these changes in you. And at the second level, you know, as we get into it, we'll find out that, that God is able to feed us with meat and, and give us revelations that will make us stronger and prepare us for things that are going to happen. Now, uh, the second baptism is the, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit represents stage number two, which John refers to as the teenage stage. He calls it a young man stage. Okay, we're not fully perfect yet, but we're not what we were before. We're in between. The teenage stage. That's what John refers it to. Now, at that stage, uh, well, we're going to look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it represents that stage. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is often misunderstood. There's a lot of people who believe that you're only baptized in the Holy Spirit when you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is not true. Okay? But there's some truth in it. What I mean by that is that the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens in two stages. It's not one event. It's in two stages. Twice we see Jesus telling his disciples that, you know, that they're receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first time, which is stage one, happens on the day of his resurrection. On the day of his resurrection, and there's only John who talks about it, um, Jesus appears uh, in, that's in John 20, verse 22. Jesus appears to his disciples behind closed doors. The doors are locked. The disciples are afraid. They, 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 don't, you know, they don't even want to get out of the house because they're afraid that they're going to get killed too. And they're shaking in their boots. And Mary Madeline has, uh, uh, just came and told him that she's seen, he's been resurrected, and she's seen him. But no, they're still in their, in their room, and they're still locked up because they're still afraid, because you know, they don't believe it. So it says that Jesus appears to them, and he shows them his hands and his side to prove that it's really him. But then he does something that only John talks about. And in verse 22, and he says, When he had said these things, he breathed on them, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So that was the first stage. The first stage is the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the receiving of the Holy Ghost. So he says to his disciples, Now he breathed on them to signify to them, that, would, that was a clue to them of what God had done to Adam. How Adam became a living soul by God breathing his breath on them. Now, we, we don't need to breathe on people to receive the Holy Ghost today. We receive the Holy Ghost automatically at salvation. Okay, automatically at salvation, the Holy Ghost comes in. It's automatic. But at this time, the period between the new covenant started with John the Baptist and Jesus' death on the cross was different. See, the, Holy, the, the disciples had already been under Jesus' teachings for three years. They've, uh, the, Jesus' teachings had done some effect on them because in John chapter uh, 15, I think it's verse 3, Jesus says unto them, You are now clean by the words I've spoken unto you. So the word of God had been working in them. 
but they still didn't have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit couldn't come in that form until Jesus left. Jesus had told his disciple, it's important that I go away because if I don't go away, I can't send him. So he says, but if I go away, I will send him and the spirit that is now with you will be in you. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit could not happen until Jesus died. So though the, Holy, though the disciples were under Jesus' teachings, and though the teachings of Jesus had made them clean, they still weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus appeared on that day and said, I've done what I'm supposed to do. And he breathed on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. But the, the, the breathing was just a gesture to remind them about what God had done to Adam, making him a living soul. At that point, they became a living soul because you're a living soul once the Holy Spirit comes in you. Because the Holy Spirit is the connection between you and God. He's the life. See, when we sin, sin separates us from God. When we receive Jesus, the Holy Ghost comes in and we're reconnected to God through the Holy Ghost. So that was the first time that Jesus talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He, he breathed on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is stage one. Now, after that, later on, it doesn't happen right away. Some people try to make both things happen at the same time. It doesn't happen at the same time. There has to be some growth in between it. Okay? But 50 days later, Jesus tells his disciples, and that's in Acts uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 4, 5, uh, and 8 that we're going to read. But the second time, 50 days later, Jesus tells his, tells his disciples, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait there for the promise of the Father. And he says, then he, I'll read them, and he says uh, in verse 5, he says, For truly John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost in, in not too long from now. Now we know that they have already been baptized with the indwelling of the Holy Ghost in the room where they were locked. But now he's saying, I want you to go to Jerusalem, wait there, because the promise of the Father is coming, and you will be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yes, this is phase two of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yet there's two phases to it. So they went to there, and, and Jesus basically tells us why the, this second stage is for in verse 8. He says, and you shall receive power, which means strength, ability, virtue, including miracle power or supernatural power, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, so that you can be witnesses, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and all the world. So God said, Jesus says, I'm sending you to Jerusalem to receive phase two of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which will give you power, not power so that to elevate you above everybody else, not power so that you're better than everybody else, so that you can become witnesses, so that we can become the temple that we're talking about, the light in this world. We can't do it without the power. Okay? So the second phase is the phase power. The first phase of the baptism of the Spirit is the indwelling of the Spirit. The Spirit starts working on us and we get to a place where we're ready for phase two where power comes into us to help us become that light that God has talking about. Now, so we can't say that somebody who has no gifts of the Spirit is not baptized in the Spirit. They are, but they're only under phase one. And phase one will remain phase one until you get to a place where the Holy Spirit can start teaching you and you start growing so that the power can be given to you. Now, the power comes in two ways. Yes, there's gifts, and, uh, and we focus on the gifts a lot, but those gifts are only there to make us witnesses. They're, they're not there to make us super Christians, okay? They're made there to make us witnesses. It's just so that we can become a better channel for God to work through. And God can touch people through us. I mean, even Jesus said that when he healed people, when he cast out demons, he was doing it through the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Jesus doing it. He says, I'm only a channel. The Holy Spirit is doing it in me. It's God through his Spirit touching the people. You know? <clears throat> but if you don't want those gifts, a lot of people refuse the gifts. A lot of people say it's, it's past. And this and that. You still have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit can't do what it wants to do. And you can't move beyond where you are. You can't grow. You can't, you know, you're going to stay at this stage of, you know, of being 
a child and a teenager between, like, you know, you, 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 you're, you're flip-flopping. So <coughs> Jesus says it's to receive power. Now, like I said, people, can people are baptized in the Holy Spirit automatically at salvation if their salvation was genuine. You know, but they don't have the power right now. They don't have the strength. Now, the way that the Holy Spirit gives us that strength, He doesn't give us the gifts right away. He starts by teaching us the Word. Because the Word makes us strong. Jesus says He's the Spirit of truth who will lead us into all truth. And that truth will set us free. It will liberate us from our flesh, making us closer to God, making us stronger. Now, if we refuse that, that, that strength that He wants to give us, by not, being, by not listening to him and not being obedient, then we won't go any further. You know, I've seen pastors where people get saved and right away they want to pray for them to get the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work that way. There has to be some growth in between. They're not ready to use those gifts. If somebody who is still carnal, because we're carnal at salvation. Paul just told us, we're children, we're carnal. If somebody who is that carnal was given that kind of power, they would do what they want to do, not what God want to do. I've heard some people say that if I had the gift of healing, I would walk in the hospital and heal everybody in the hospital. Okay? Yes, you could do that, but maybe that's not what God wants to do. You're supposed to do what God wants with those gifts, not what you want with those gifts. So unless you're ready to have those gifts, God won't give them to you. There's a Christian band called Whiteheart that has a song called Baby with Power Tools that deals with that. That you know, God is not going to give those gifts to people who are not ready to use them, who don't understand how to use them. So the first phase, in this, I mean, in the second phase of power, the first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit tries to strengthen you, to make you stronger, to the educating you to, in the Word, to trying to show you what the Word wants you to do, to encourage you to do what the Word wants you to do. And, and your job is to learn and to be obedient. And as you learn and be obedient, then the Holy Spirit can move you on to the supernatural powers. Now, in the case of Jesus and the disciples, it only took 50 days. Why? Because the disciples had already been three years under Jesus' ministry. They had heard the message of Jesus. They had the message of Jesus in them. Jesus also told them, when the Spirit comes, He will remind you of what I've said. Meaning that it's already in them. All that the Spirit had to do was remind them of those things. Us, when we start, we start at zero. We have no word in us. We have no clue what Jesus said. We have no clue what's in the Bible. We start at zero. So it takes longer for us to get to this power gift stage. Because we have to learn to grow and we have to be exposed to the, whole, to the, to the Word of God and, and, and accept the Word of God and try to change our lives. And there's a growth period. You know? So in the kind of, for the disciples, 50 days was all they needed. But for us, it takes a while. I mean, and for people to try to force the gifts on people before their time, they end up being false gifts. I mean, there's people who go around and say, I'm a prophet. And everything they say never comes to be. They're not a prophet. The Bible tells you that if a prophet prophesies something and it doesn't happen, they're not a prophet. But there's a lot of people who say, I'm a prophet. There's a lot of people who say, I've got the gift of healing. And they pray for people and they don't get healed. Because they don't have the gift of healing. No, because they're not ready for it yet. But they want to believe that they are. Because people told them, you need those things in your life. They will come when the time comes. As the Spirit Decides as God leads. Now we are told in the uh, in the Bible in First Thessalonians five nineteen that we should not quench the Spirit, and we are told in Ephesians that we should not grieve the Spirit, because when we quench the Spirit and when we grieve the Spirit, we stop our growth. We stop the Spirit from being able to do what He wants to do. To to quench the Spirit is to turn a deaf ear. The Holy Spirit tells you to turn right. You turn a deaf ear, you turn left. You do what you want. The Holy Spirit says, forgive that person. You don't forgive that person. The Holy Spirit tells you, whatever. You do contrary to what He tells you. That's quenching Him. And grieving the Holy Spirit is being rebellious. 
knowing that you have the ability to do this and you refuse to do it. That grieves the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit sees so much more you could do and you refuse to go. Now, grieving the Holy Spirit is actually something that you really don't want to do because in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 63.10, we are told that the people rebelled and they vexed or they grieved the Spirit. Therefore, God turned and became their enemy. So the Old, the Old Testament tells us that when we grieve the Holy Spirit on purpose, when we refuse to obey, we, 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 we just do our own thing, then God doesn't become our father like we want him to be. He becomes our enemy. Now, what does it mean, God becoming our enemy? It means that he removes his mercy and his grace from us. You don't want to listen. You know, you don't have that anymore. You, you lose whatever righteousness that you could have because, uh, you know, you've tried to be faithful, but you're still doing your own thing. And, and the only way to grow is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and having our ears open to what he says. So in this growth period, you know, between stage two and stage three is all about learning to be obedient, learning to have the fear of God and being taught by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is simple, uh, also says in James 4, 4, that whoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. If you choose the world over, over God, then God says you're my enemy. In the Old Testament, it says that we hate him when we do that. You know, God says, I, the, the people who love me, I will bless them up to the fourth generation. You know, or I, I think it's a thousand generations, sorry. But the people who hate me, you know, they, they have this curse on them up to four generations. Which tells us that when we do things, we don't only affect us, we affect the people behind us. You know? Because if I'm faithful to God, God promised to bless up to a thousand generations, to watch over up to a thousand generations. But if I do my own thing and I decide to, to live my life carnally and, and not to listen to the Holy Spirit, I bring trouble not just on me, but it goes from generation to generation too. So we don't want to offend the Holy Spirit. And if we are obedient to the Holy Spirit, we start producing fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are the characteristic of God. Slowly, we are changing into God's image. But it only happens through obedience to the Holy Spirit. And as we get these fruits, the Bible says it is through our fruits that God is glorified. You know, if I tell you I'm a Christian, and I, back, I talk in your back, and, uh, you know, uh, I curse you, and I do... I'm not, uh, I'm not a blessing to you. I'm not a good representation of God. But if I change my fruits by being obedient to the Holy Spirit, I gain fruits of righteousness where it's my own righteousness now. It's not the righteousness of Jesus that I depend on anymore, but my own righteousness. Then at that point, you know, I become a person that God can work with. I can become a person that can be a witness for him. You know, a light for him in this world. Now, this is what uh, John has to say about the teenage years, okay, or the teenage spiritual years, or phase two. He says, I write unto you, young man, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, young man, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So to know if you're growing up in phase two, is to, uh, to see the word of God in you, you getting strength. And the first thing he says is because you've overcome the wicked one. Because one thing that most baby Christians are is they are afraid of Satan. They talk about Satan. And sometimes the way they talk about Satan, they give more glory to him than they give to God. Because every time you say how bad Satan is, you're giving him glory because that's what he wants to be. You know, but here a sign is that you overcome the wicked one. Satan's not a problem to you in your teenage years. You've overcome that. You, why you overcome that? Because of the word of God. You found out in the word of God that Jesus has given you authorities over his ability. Jesus says that in Luke 10, 19. I've given you authority over his abilities. Yes, Satan has abilities. There's certain things he can do, but you have the authority. You can stop those things. You can change those things. You know, 
And then uh, the, in James we find out that if we resist him, he has to flee. You know, he doesn't have the power. If, he, if we resist him, he has to flee. He has no other choice. He tempted Jesus in the desert three times. After that, it says he left for a season, hoping to come back when Jesus would be weaker because there's no, he had no power against Jesus. The only power Satan has is the power of suggestion. He will suggest to you to behave and act a certain way. If you do it, he won. If you don't do it, there's nothing he can do. And finally, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us that he's like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He can't devour anybody, but if somebody lets themselves be devoured, he will devour them. He doesn't have the authority. We are God's property. We've been bought with a price. He doesn't have any authority over us. We belong to God. And even when he wants to approach somebody, we have an example in the, in the gospel where Satan wanted to interact with Peter. He wanted to to affect Peter and he says Jesus came to Peter and says Satan has approached God and he wants to swift you like wheat he wants to come against you to make you fall Peter and he said basically he said God said yes to Satan because he says but when you come out of it feed your your brothers take care of uh, uh, of your brothers you know so Satan has to approach God I mean we see that in Job too I mean, you know, uh, Satan needed God's permission to interact with, with, with Job. Now, God will not give Satan permission unless he knows we can do it. We can stand strong and we can come through it. And he will do it also to make us stronger. But that's in phase three. All right? But <clears throat> all these things are important. So we're a young man. We have overcome the wicked one. But there is still a problem at, the, at the, this stage. We are still dealing with youthful lusts. Paul says, uh, gives us a warning in 2 Timothy that we should flee youthful lusts. In other words, at this stage, we're no longer afraid of Satan, but we, are not, we haven't totally released all of our carnal stuff away. We're still holding on to some stuff. Stuff that, that we are able to get rid of, but we're still choosing to hold on to. Now we come to stage number three, which is represented by the baptism of fire. Now, a lot of people have associated the baptism of fire with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the, the, the power stage, because it says that they saw tongues of fire come down on the people. Now, if you read that passage correctly, it doesn't say tongues of fire came on people. It says what looks like tongues of fire. They're trying to describe what happened in that room. What really happened in that room was the glory of God came upon them. Okay? But they didn't know how to describe it. So they just said it looks like tongues of fire. This is not the fire that, that the, the baptism of fire has reference to. The, the baptism of fire is, is all about the fire that purifies us. We sang a song earlier, purify my heart, Lord God, make me as gold and precious silver. That's what the baptism of fire is all about, is to burn all the impurities all out of you so that you become back totally into God's image. Now, this is a process that we're going to go on until the day we die, because as God works on one thing and then we fix one thing, then something else comes up to the surface, and then we got something else to work on. You know, it's, it's a walk towards perfection. I mean, even Paul at the end of his life said, I didn't attain perfection yet. I'm not where I want to be. But I fought the good fight, I kept the faith, and now there's waiting for me a crown of life. You know, so it's going to be something that we're going to be on. But as we get closer and closer to God, there's a point where God will change the intimacy with us again one more time. And um, we have achieved spiritual maturity. We're at the last stage. Now, um, so in Job 23.10, Job says, but he, speaking of God, knows the way that I take. So God knows me, he says. And he has tried me, or he has chosen to put me through trials and tribulations in order to bring me out as gold, in order to purify me as gold. Okay, so God uses the fire to purify us. You know, that's why James says, count it all joy when you fall into trials and temptation. You should be happy that God allows you to go through these things. That means that God wants to bring you higher. He wants to bring you to a higher level. 
And he says, because out of those times, you learn to have patience. And then in Romans, it adds, you learn to have hope and experience. You know, it's, it's in those times that we learn who God is, who we are, what God wants from us, and what we still need to change. You know, nobody likes trials and temptation, but it's in those, day, in those times that we get purified. You know, when God allows things to happen to us. Now, he never allows anything that will destroy us, but he does allow things to correct us. Because that's what the final uh, phase is all about. It's God's correction so that we can be purified. So Paul says, nobody likes this, but it's only for a season. That's in 1 Peter 1, uh, sorry, it's not Paul, Peter. 1 Peter 1, 6, he says, though for a season you need to, uh, to have multiple t temptation. So God brings us through seasons of that. You know, he doesn't just overwhelm us. If God would give us a list of everything we have to change, on the day we get saved, none of us would continue. Instead, God brings us step by step, you know. And I know in my own personal life, so sometimes I, I would say, well, I don't have this in my life. And then suddenly God puts me in a situation, whoa, I am like that. I didn't think I was like that. You know, uh, it, sometimes it's, it, God has to open our eyes through putting us in certain situations for it to happen. But it's, it, uh, Peter goes on to say, but the trial of your faith being much precious than gold that perishes, though it you be tried with fire, that you might be found unto praise, honor, glory at the appearing of Christ. So, God, so he says, all these tests that God will allow you to go through is to bring you to a place of honor, of glory, you know, until uh, for, the, uh, for the return of Jesus. Now Jesus spoke of this baptism because he had to go through it too. Because we forget that Jesus, the Son of God, was also Jesus, the Son of Man. And as Jesus, the Son of Man, as he had his flesh to deal with too. So God had to bring him to certain situation to make him realize, you know, that he has a flesh to deal with. Now, some, lots of times the flesh is referred to as Satan, you know, because it's the nature of Satan. <coughs> and uh, one of these occasions was the cross. Now, we know that uh, in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, we're told that Jesus was led of the Spirit, so led of God, of the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And he was tempted there in, uh, in three different temptations, and then the devil left him alone. And that temptation was to, prove, to see if he was ready to start his ministry, because when he came out of the wilderness, his ministry started. If he would have failed in the wilderness, the ministry would have never started. So God tested him to see, okay, as Jesus, the Son of Man, are you ready to do what Jesus, the Son of God, is supposed to do? So he brought him to the wilderness to be tempted. He was tempted, he passed the test, and then when he came out, his ministry started. You know? And the same thing with us. Now, I've heard uh, many different preachers say that you know, God will, before he brings you to the next level, he will test you. It's just like uh, you know, in school, before they put you in grade two, they'll test you. Uh, they'll give you a test to see if you learn grade, uh, grade one. <clears throat> so in Matthew 20, verse 22, 23, uh, well, Matthew 20, starting at verse 20, we see um, the, the mother of James and John approach Jesus, and she says, I would like you, Jesus, that in your kingdom that you have James and John on either side of you, at one at your right hand and one on your, on your left hand. And Jesus turns to James and John, and he says this. He says, and Jesus said unto them, I uh, know ye not, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I, that I have to drink? And are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Okay. So Jesus saw the cross as this baptism also. And he, he said unto them, indeed, you will, you will drink the cup I'm drinking. In other words, you'll come to a place where you'll have to do the will of God and not your will. So that will come, and you will have to be baptized too. So, but he's referring here to the cross, okay? And we all have to have cups that God will give us to drink. There's things that God will ask from us that we have to do, you know, regardless if we like it or not. And in those times, we have to make a decision. Now, the cross itself was not the baptism. That was the cup. Going to the cross was the cup that the Father gave him. Jesus knew that from the foundation of the world, that he had to do that. That was the will of God. The baptism 
was the anxiety and, and, and the pressure that he would feel from his flesh not to go there. That was a baptism. Jesus says, I got to go through a baptism right now. A baptism for where I'm going to be fighting with my flesh. And I know we fought uh, his flesh. To the point where his sweat turned into blood. To the point that he asked the father three times to change it. Knowing that the father would not change it. Because he had been decided from the beginning of, or the foundation of the world. But the anxiety, the fight that you have with your flesh, that was his flesh crying out to God, I don't want this to happen. That was Jesus, the Son of Man. You know, his flesh crying out. And that's part of the baptism of fire, is the fight we have with our flesh. And, and, and God kept silent throughout the whole thing. God never said a word, you know. The only time that the angels came and appeared to him was after he made the decision, okay, I'm going to do it, Lord. You know, and then, you know, they ministered to him. But this is our fight. This is the st third stage that God brings us to in our growth, is the fire, where we fight our flesh, where we, in order to become pure as gold and silver. Now, we, uh, that means to become more and more into his likeness. Okay? And... <clears throat> We are almost done with this, but I will stop here today. But Louis is gone next weekend again, so we're going to be continuing next week because uh, Louis is going out of town next, uh, next weekend also. So I want to stop here because I, I'm, I'm feeling I'm rushing and I'm not going to say everything that I feel God wants me to say. So I don't want to rush, but we'll pick up from here next week and, and go on. Uh, but Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for your love. We thank you for everything you do for us and for all these stages we go through that you have given us your Holy Spirit to guide us through all these things, Lord God. Help us to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Help us not to quench the Spirit, but, but to follow his leading and to become more like you by producing fruits of righteousness, Lord God, and producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Lord, which are your characteristic. We love you, Lord. And we ask you in Jesus' name, Lord God, to, to open our eyes to your word this week as we read, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.